politicians from around the world will be gathering across Europe to mark the centenary of the armistice. In Paris, President Emmanuel Macron will be joined by Donald Trump, Angela Merkel and Vladimir Putin, among others, at the Arc de Triomphe. In London, the Queen will be leading commemorations at the Cenotaph with the Prime Minister and the Labour leader. Well, joining us now is Labour's Shadow Defence Secretary, Mia Griffith. Thank you very much for being with us. Pleasure. 100 years since the end of the First World War. Why do you think it is that this war has really become so ingrained and so important for our national identity and our national consciousness? Well, I think it's been very heartwarming to see the real unity across the whole country in really being determined to recognise the appalling sacrifice that people made in that war and the terrible loss of life. And I think from that as well, what people want to see now is also the reconciliation. So this weekend, we're talking about the signing of that armistice. We're talking about bringing peace to Europe and we're talking about the real determination there was to make sure that nothing like this ever happened again. Now, we know that sadly, that was not the case. But I think it's very important that when we look back and we remember and we remember the sacrifice, we also think about the real importance of diplomatic initiatives now in the present day to make sure that we don't have unnecessary conflict. Diplomatic initiatives. What, what, what are those lessons, do you think, then? Well, the, the League of Nations was set up after the First World War and the United Nations after the Second World War. And however imperfect it is, having a rules-based system, having unity amongst the sensible nations of the world, if you like, trying to make sure that we do talk rather than fight is just very, very important. And it worries me very considerably when we see some you know, rather inappropriate um, perhaps uh, uh, flaunting of those, those rules. Um, what, what do you mean by the inappropriate flaunting of Well, I think there are two things. I think certainly we've seen some very aggressive acts by some nations, such as Russia, for example, but I also think we've seen the denigration by Trump of some of those very institutions that we rely on to keep that peace. Um, what did you make of um, Donald Trump's decision to not visit the uh, war cemetery uh, in France yesterday because of the bad weather? I was absolutely horrified, quite frankly, when you think of the sacrifice that people made. And I think people up and down the country and across Europe, whatever their political views, do think that it's very, very important that we commemorate what happened. And I think people were really taken aback by that. I think he made a, a serious misjudgment about the mood across Europe. Um, I want to talk to you uh, about some comments that were made earlier this week by a very prominent Labour Party supporter about the poppy. Um, Aaron Bastani, uh, who is one of your you know, most high-profile activists, shall we say, someone who's very active on social media, uh, said this. I think the poppy appeal is grotesque. It has a kind of triumphalist militarism about it. It's racist, right? It's right super white supremacist. I mean, you're wearing a poppy. What well, well this is absolute nonsense. And first of all, I must say, this person no way represents the Labour Party. And I can assure you that up and down the, the country, Labour politicians will be proudly wearing their poppy today. They will be at the Cenotaph uh, this morning and they recognise the huge sacrifice that has been made by our armed forces, both in the First World War and in conflict since. And they recognise that this is a time we come together and we remember and that there has been so much good work done by the Royal British Legion that I find the, you know, the, 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 the comments that, uh, that this uh, single person made completely unrepresentative and, quite frankly, an utter disgrace. I mean, you say that it's not representative, but he is somebody who uh, is a very prominent cheerleader for Jeremy Corbyn. He has a very large social media following. I mean, should he be thrown out of the party? Well, he's one individual. He's one individual who's put his views up on, on, on social media. And I can assure you that he really does not represent mainstream feeling within the party. Uh, personally, I think it, uh, the remarks are absolutely abhorrent. Should he be thrown out? And, well, I would like him to, to, to retract on those comments. I certainly would. Um, whether he's to be thrown out is a matter for the party to consider. OK, thank you. Uh, now, later on in the show, uh, we're going to be seeing what happens when I sat down with three veterans who talk very frankly about mental health and some of the issues that members of our armed forces face when they leave the army. Mm -hmm. um, the lack of support, the fact that you know, there are, um, sadly, so many people who take their own lives. 
What's Labour's position on how we should tackle this? Well, we want to see a really joined up approach right across government. It's very important that when people leave the forces, many of them transition extremely well into civilian life. But for those who need extra support, it should be there. And it has to be a, a joined up process right across government. So what we set out as our strategy is to make sure that we have the funding in to uh, ensure that mental health provision is there for those that need it, that we deal with the housing crisis so that there are houses available and we get rid of the scourge of rough sleeping and that we also make absolutely certain that the skills that the veterans have are properly recognised and that if they need additional support to get additional qualifications um, or apprenticeships or a first job interview that the support is there to do that because obviously they do have skills they're not necessarily recognised by employers and it's important that they get into uh, a successful second career and they also have housing and then they also have access to proper mental health services. Mm -hmm. so that recognition of skills actually is something that they sort of directly spoke about. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's interesting mm -hmm. to hear you say that. Um, another Labour Party policy that I was keen to talk to you about is Trident. Mm -hmm. um, now, currently, of course, it is Labour's policy to renew uh, nuclear deterrent. However, the Shadow Peace Minister, uh, Fabian Hamilton, carrying out a review to see if alternative jobs can be found for those people working in the defence industry, uh, he says that he hopes that he sincerely hopes that the review he's undertaking will convince people to drop their support of Trident. So, what, what's happening there? You know, is, is Trident definitely going to be um, in Labour Party policy going forward? Well, we are absolutely committed to the Trident program. The decision was taken so back in 2007. Well, the, the decision was taken back in 2007, and it's settled Labour Party policy now. Um, Fabian Hamilton can express his own views, but for the, you know, the, the, the mainstream Labour Party position on this is that we are totally committed to the Trident nuclear deterrent. And you mustn't muddle up the Trident nuclear deterrent and the whole issue of industrial diversification. Yeah, but at the same time, though, this is one of your junior shadow cabinet ministers, I mean, he does speak for the party and he's very clear that he says that, you know, he's always said that party policy should renew Trident, but I say we should scrap it. That's also the view of the leader of the party. And he sincerely hopes the review he's undertaking will convince unions to drop their support as well. Mm. Well, as I say, it's there not are very two, helpful if, you, if you're the, arguing in favour of keeping Trident. Those are two very separate issues. First and foremost, um, we are committed to the deterrent. The deterrent is extremely important. It's a very important part of our defence policy. And so we... Went, uh, we made the decision to renew it back in 2007 and obviously that's now 11 years ago and the process is well down the line now. In terms of defence diversification, we have talked in a very different way about industrial diversification because we recognise that there's immense inequality across the regions of the UK and we recognise that part of ensuring that no region is too dependent, for example, on the coal industry or the steel industry is to make sure that there is better redistribution of opportunity so that people in okay. every area of the UK have good opportunities uh, for, for career opportunities. Um, now, I'm keen to talk to you as well about Brexit. Um, Jeremy Corbyn uh, gave an interview this week and he was asked if he would stop Brexit if he could. And we can have a look at the answer that he gave on Brexit. He said, we can't stop it. The referendum took place. Article 50 has been triggered. Is your leader right to say that you can't stop Brexit? Well, I think the, the, the decision was taken back in 2016 and very clearly the people of the UK voted to leave the European Union. But you can stop it, can't you, if you wanted to? Well, what we want to see is a proper deal because I know that many of those people who voted leave certainly did not want to see jobs and the economy decimated. They wanted to see a Brexit that works for jobs and the economy, not the sort of factionalism we're seeing in the Tory party now. At the same time, though, I can't help but thinking that if this is right, that Jeremy Corbyn believes you can't stop Brexit, then the motion you passed at your conference was basically a bit of a con, because that said, if we cannot get a general election, Labour must support all options remaining on the table, including campaigning for a public vote. But your leader is saying that Brexit can't be stopped. Well, well those things don't add up, do they? Well, I, I think you have to take things step by step. We've said very, very clearly we do not want a situation of no deal. We have also said very clearly that we cannot be voting for a bad deal or a blind Brexit. So what we are saying is we need Theresa May now to come back with a proper deal which protects jobs and the economy, which gives us that closest possible relationship to the single market. 
And that's the sort of deal we want to see on the table. So and can Brexit be stopped? Well, I think the, the answer to that is that we are... Uh, we are committed to getting a Brexit that works. We want a Brexit that works in terms of jobs and the economy. We are prepared, as Keir Starmer set out today, to work with MPs across the board to get something which is workable. And that's where we are at this present time. We want to make sure... So is a second referendum one of the options on the table? Well, in our, in our um, view, what we actually need to do is get a proper deal that works. Now... If this government is incapable of negotiating that deal, then the best option, as far as we're concerned, would be to throw the government out and have a team in there which can get a good deal. In other words, we'd like to have a general election. If that's not an option, then we've said quite clearly we are prepared to work across the board to try and get a deal which would be workable. Um, and I think the, the whole issue about a people's vote uh, arises because of the prospect of a bad deal. And I think if a good deal were on the table that did do, as I've said, protect jobs and the economy, then I think that issue would not be half as, 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 as vibrant as it is. OK. Neil Griffith, thank you very much.